The content herein is for informational purposes only, not intended as medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, and is not to be substituted for direct advice from your doctor. Today's LymphCast program is proudly sponsored by Vita Support MD, the makers of Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000. These MPFF-based nutraceuticals are backed by science and recommended by doctors specializing in venous and lymphatic disorders. Visit VitaSupportMD.com to learn more. Welcome to LymphCast, the show that brings together doctors, other health professionals, and special guests to discuss lymphedema, venous disease, and other associated disorders, and what can be done if this is affecting your life. Now it's time to sit back, relax, as it's time to learn all about lymphedema, venous disease, and associated disorders on our show, LymphCast. Greetings and welcome to the LymphCast show. This is episode 14. Thank you for being with us. Whether you're watching, listening, or both, uh, we are glad you're here. For all the medical professionals out there, certainly, but also the non-medical professionals, patients, potential patients, uh, just want to know what's going on in the world. Uh, We are glad that you are with us. Uh, Let's go ahead and uh, meet the panel. Uh, From New Jersey, uh, the founder and creator of Vita Support MD, makers of Vein Formula 1000, and Lymphatic Formula 1000 physician, surgeon, Dr. John A. Chuback, also the creator of this show. Greetings, uh, Dr. Chuback. How are you? Greetings, Paul. Good to see you. Excited about today's program. We have a very esteemed guest, so uh, let's not waste uh, much time in uh, introducing this gentleman and getting on to a great discussion, please. Okay, I'll finish the panel, and then we'll get right to it. From Arizona, Dr. Monica Glavitsky. Uh, Greetings, Dr. Glavitsky. How are you? Hi, um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm happy to be with all of you, and I'm happy particularly uh, because of our special guest today. It's my understanding you might know him on a personal basis. Is that correct? Safe to assume? Yes, yes, (laughs) (laughs) absolutely. He is my wonderful husband, my best friend, my mentor, my everything. All right. Uh, from California, let's say hello to Dr. Emily Eicher. Greetings, Dr. Eicher. How are you? So welcome. Welcome, everybody. All right. Very good. And let's meet the gentleman who will also bring in our special guest uh, from the state of Minnesota, Dr. Mark Moline. Greetings, uh, Dr. Moline. How are you, sir? Good to see you, Paul. Thank you for uh, hosting today. You bet. And would you like to have the honor of uh, bringing in our special guest? It, it is a distinct honor. And I just I want to introduce Dr. Peter Glavitsky, who has, uh, you know, he's been a phenomenal mentor and leader for many of us. I had the um, privilege of training in Rochester under his um, tutorship and uh, always kind, always graceful, phenomenal father, great husband. And um, when you when you put it in the scope of what he's accomplished from a national, but more importantly, from an international standpoint, because it really speaks to it started with, and he's, I'm sure he'll end up talking about this, but his um, his ability as a magician was recognized internationally. And he really had a um, magical component, both in clinic as well as in the operating room. And I, I think that that engineering mind matched with a skill set that is really unparalleled from an international standpoint. It's recognized by his continued um, his continued activities within Hungary, being recognized within uh, Semmelweis, recently had an operating room named after him. That was a phenomenal picture if you haven't seen it. He was uh, chair of the um, Department of uh, Vascular Surgery and Endovascular Surgery at Mayo Clinic from 2000 to 2010. Had a really significant impact on that campus growth in many ways. Was uh, editor-in-chief of the Journal of Vascular Surgery from 2016, just having stepped down in 2022. Um, he's had a huge influence on many institutions, including the um, University of Washington, where Mark Meisner is right now, where there's an endowed uh, chair in his name that Mark Meisner currently uh, ha- uh, sits at. Greater than 700 presentations, uh, uh, 26,000 citations. 
And we could go in many directions, Dr. Glavisky, with this, but it, it's certainly just an honor to have you uh, with us present day, as it's an honor to have your wife with us every single week when we do LymphCast. So I, we don't want to miss under... We, we can't understate the importance of having Monica with us too, and it's always a privilege to spend time with Monica. I'm, if it's okay, I want to open with one question. Um, and, it, and it goes directly, directly to lymphatics because Peter started in the world of lymphatics long before any of us realized what a lymphatic was. And if I could just ask, who was your inspiration and what was your vision when you started with lymphatics in the research lab back in the 1970s, because it was really uh, um, not on so many people's radar screen at that time, and you were already literally light years ahead of people's understanding and consideration about surgical techniques at that time. Thank you, Mark. And uh, before I answer your question, let me uh, uh, tell you and all of you what an honor it is to be uh, a part of this webinar and uh, talk to uh, uh, all of you about the topics uh, that are so close to my heart. Uh, the closest to my heart, of course, is my wonderful wife, Monica, who uh, I'm so glad has a, a, a real interest in uh, lymphatic problems, venous problems, and who has been, uh, you know, uh, such a great uh, 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 collaborator and uh, uh, a partner uh, uh, during uh, this uh, uh, lifetime uh, uh, travel that I uh, have done during uh, the past uh, uh, many decades. So uh, uh, coming back to the uh, uh, question of lymphatics, uh, you know, I uh, uh, graduated, as you mentioned, uh, at Semmelweis University. Uh, I hate to say it, but it was the early 70s. And uh, my professor uh, of vascular surgery, Professor Schultes at the university, he had a real interest in lymphedema because uh, at that time, the idea was that vascular surgery should include arteries, veins, and lymphatics. And obviously the, the most important lymphatic uh, uh, problem, chronic lymphatic problem is lymphedema, and uh, nobody was really interested uh, other than our professor, and I thought that would be an interesting area. So in the, the mid-70s, I spent a year in Paris with a scholarship, uh, and uh, I, uh, I, I was a uh, resident of uh, Professor Cervel, Marceau Cervel, who uh, was even at that time a world famous uh, cardiovascular surgeon, also with a special interest in uh, lymphedema. And uh, at the university, uh, I worked with Professor uh, Hidden, Hidden, starts with an H, and uh, she was interested in lymphedema. And actually, the thesis I wrote at that time and uh, the experimental work I did was on microsurgical lymphovenous anastomosis because I thought this is a new area. Uh, I learned a, a very special field of uh, vascular surgery, microvascular surgery. And uh, indeed, this research work that I did in Paris helped me to get uh, to Mayo Clinic as a research fellow uh, because there were not too many vascular surgeons, I have to say, at Mayo Clinic who were interested in microvascular uh, reconstructions or even in venous reconstruction, which was part of my research at that time. So this is how I started. And I am really uh, pleased to see that the technology developed so much, you know, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the um, super microscopic lymphatic reconstructions today have real results and the real uh, indications and the real place in the management of uh, uh, chronic uh, postmostectomy and lower extremity lymphedemas. When you, when you began that work, was there anybody else that you were, anybody else in the world that was working on that because, or does that, were you truly among that first generation creating the foundation 
to really establish the field? Um, I was not the first. I was not the first. Uh, there was a microvascular group in Australia, uh, Professor O'Brien, who was very much interested in that. Uh, there was a, uh, a Polish group headed by uh, Professor Olszewski, mm -hmm. who uh, actually with Nielubowicz uh, described first lymph node vein anastomosis, again, a little bit different type of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, lymphovenous uh, connections. And then in South America, Mario Deni, who did the uh, uh, antocide uh, uh, lymphovenous uh, anastomosis that actually I went to see uh, in Sao Paulo to see how he did it in the mid 70s. But the real microvascular uh, reconstructions were done in very small groups all around the world. O'Brien in Australia, uh, um, uh, who else? There was a there was a, a, a French group at that time who was interested in that, and uh, uh, Baumeister Rudiger Baumeister in uh, in Munich, uh, who was an outstanding uh, uh, microvascular surgeon. There was a, a group in Moscow, Krilov, who was very much devoted to that, uh, and I have to give credit to him because his work really helped microvascular surgery. Uh, and uh, the Italian school uh, was there. You know, Cariatti, Tosatti, and uh, several uh, others who had an interest in lymphedema. And so as we look forward to the, the American Venus Lymphatic Society Uni Union of International Phobology meetings coming up in Miami in September, um, obviously a great opportunity to, to bring individuals together. If you could bring together your who's who team for September, who would you bring into a, uh, a meeting forum to educate us on current techniques for management of both cancer-related lymphedema as well as venous-related lymphedema? Well, in, in, in microvascular reconstructions, we now have uh, you know quite a few teams all around the world, uh, in Austria, in Taiwan, uh, even in Budapest, they started uh, a program. Uh, we had a chance to see the Mount Sinai group uh, have a presentation at the American Surgical, uh, a, a very impressive uh, series of patients with uh, uh, a, a pedicle to lymph node uh, transplantation. Uh, the Mayo Clinic, both in uh, Rochester and in uh, uh, Jacksonville, Florida has a group, and uh, uh, and uh, Anderson uh, uh, Cancer Center in Houston. So I, I think there are altogether, uh, you know, uh, uh, several strong groups. Maybe the the, the real strong uh, uh, interest in this field uh, is in Taiwan, China, and Japan. Historically, they've seemed to be very, very aggressive in radical lymphadenectomy as it relates to malignancy and oncologic surgery. So I was going to ask if the Japanese had any major role in, role in the reconstructive end of things. So much so that some, uh, some of the, the first papers that we published in the Journal of Vascular Surgery of the super microscopic techniques, and I'm talking super microscopic because these are uh, you operate on blood vessels, lymph vessels, uh, less than uh, one millimeter in size with magnification that exceeds 15, 20 times, 25 times uh, uh, of, of uh, you know, uh, normal, uh, normal views. Uh, and since we talk about that, I cannot help mentioning the name, of, the name of Julius Jacobson, who died yesterday, uh, who uh, was at age 95, uh, at, an incredible uh, uh, member of the uh, US uh, surgical community, uh, head of surgery at Mount Sinai, and pioneer who established microvascular surgery in this country. Uh, so, uh, 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 Julius Jacobson published even lymphovenous anastomosis 
in the 1960s, early 60s, uh, which is amazing. Uh, but in general, you know, uh, everybody in the microvascular world gives credit to uh, Julius Jacobson uh, for a lot of things, including his uh, extreme generosity to support uh, the American College of Surgeons, but also because he is considered as the grandfather or creator of microvascular surgery. So I'm glad, he, uh, glad I could mention that. Well, and, it, and it's timely that we can pay homage to, you know, the giants of the field, right, that have really advanced the science and and advanced patient care. So th I'm so glad you brought that uh, fact up. Thank you. I, I, I want to pivot for a moment just because you had a biography that just was published from Semmelweis University. And I, I have a copy of the book, um, Magic and Medicine. And if you, if you are at all interested in a phenomenal life story, uh, get this book. Um, so let's start with a magic component because I, I, many people in your close circle know your international proudness as a magician. Uh, you've obviously performed at many medical meetings, but can you take us back to your childhood, how you got into medicine, how you developed your skill set, and then speak to your international travels as, as a young performer? Well, I started magic very early. I was 10 years old. I met a magician who was a, an amateur magician, a colleague of my father, a physician. And he gave a magic show, showed us a few tricks. And I, I was so fascinated by that, that I wanted to do the, uh, the tricks. And uh, I, I asked him to teach me. And he was very reluctant. But then uh, he showed me one trick uh, at the time, and he said, why don't you go home, uh, practice, and come back in a week, and then I, if you are good, I will show you another one. And this went on for a couple of years. You know, he, he didn't let me perform. He just wanted me to get a, the basics, uh, uh, magic skills, you know, and I was doing tricks with the coins and thimbles and cards. And, um, and then... Uh, uh, slowly, I to perform as a young uh, a child, and then when I was 14 years old, there was a uh, star search in the Hungarian television, uh, and uh, it, it was called Kimi Tut, what can you do, you know, some kind of a, um, a, a talent show. America's and, got talent in, yeah, yeah, in those days. Yeah. Hungary has talent, that's right. And uh, amazingly, I won the first prize, or one of the first prizes. I mean, they gave out prizes in, in, uh, in uh, singing and music, but they gave out in the other categories, and I won it. And uh, I became, uh, that was the era of uh, black and white television. Everybody in the country was watching that single show that was uh, on in the evening. and. Next day, when I walked down on the street, people recognized me. I said, oh, you are the small magician. I was very small at that time, really. So I, actually, I became famous in Hungary as the small magician. <laughs> and, and this, was, this was the beginning. And then I, I started uh, to really deal with it very seriously. I got into the circuit of uh, magic competitions and congresses. And we were traveling from city to city because this was a way I could get out of communist Hungary as an artist. You know, I couldn't get out as a as a physician because you, you know, we got uh, one opportunity once every second year to uh, leave the country. And uh, but as a magician, you know, I could travel and came back. I just you know gave a percent. To my agency, and uh, they, they could get me a passport. So this is how I traveled, and and this is how I traveled the world, and this is how I ultimately, you know, got some uh, important prizes in magic competitions. Like I got the uh, silver medal at the World Championship of Magic in 1973 in in Paris, uh, and some other important. Uh, um, competition prices that made me certainly well known at that time among magicians. 
Well, and that was among incredible competition. I mean, so how did you make the decision instead of becoming a professional magician and showman, which you obviously do an incredible job of, versus going into medicine? Well, that was certainly at one point I had to make a decision because obviously you can do it uh, up to a certain point. But then when I was in Paris for a year as a, uh, as a resident, uh, um, they offered me a, a, a six week, uh, six week uh, contract in the Casino de Paris, which is a, a, a cabaret place. And um, I had to turn it down pretty much at that time. Uh, I decided that, okay, I will go and, uh, you know, do a magic show here or there, but uh, I I absolutely had no um, doubt that I would like to uh, be a vascular surgeon. And, and uh, that's, that's how I had to make that decision. Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000 from Vita Support MD are backed by science and sold in doctor's offices. If you're a physician who may be interested in prescribing or selling these excellent nutraceuticals, please call 862-246-7877 to speak to a representative today. You know, ironically, it's uh, interesting. Of course, I was, I was never at Peter's level, but through college, I was... Um, practicing some magic and sleight of hand things, card tricks and so forth. But mostly my interest was in, in the area of mentalism, what they call mentalism and psychic feats and things like that. But my, my general surgical essay was called The Magician, and it was all about magic. And I related it to um, somehow the discipline of practicing magic and preparing for performance and also, of course, dexterity and sleight of hand and, and so on and so forth. And it was a very, it was a very popular um, essay when I was going for my interviews. People said, oh, I found that very interesting. But then later I found, and Peter may know this, or Mark may agree, I found a fair number of surgeons who had had an interest in, in magic. And I think probably because we all believe that it might help our de dexterity and manual you know, gifts and, and so forth. So I've always found that was a very interesting thing. Of course, Peter had tremendous success and on a big stage, but um, I, I think that there are probably more surgeon magicians than we think. Yeah, I mean, and, and obviously, Mark knows very well uh, Dr. Ali Beers uh, at Mayo Clinic, who probably has been the most dexterous and, uh, and uh, mo uh, one of the most well-known surgeons, president of the American College of Surgeons, um, uh, and, and clearly, you know, right on the rank under the Mayo brothers, uh, who, uh, whose hobby was uh, magic. And he went through medical school as a professional magician. And, uh, and uh, the reason he became actually such a close friend of President Reagan and, uh, and uh, the White House uh, during the time when Reagan was the president because Nancy Reagan's mother was her magic agent, you know? She, uh, she had an agency and she hired Ali Beers on uh, the boat uh, in Alaska to, uh, uh, you know, for a week to do magic shows. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting. And the other thing I would say, the other analogy or, or the other, I think, key skill where surgery and magic overlap, this might not be um, self-evident to a lot of people, is, is courage. Magic uh, requires courage. To be able to perform magic in front of people, you're always concerned that it won't work or you'll be found out or you, you, you know, the sleight of hand will be seen. So I think that all of that practice and preparation and repetition is also analogous between the two fields that the day of surgery, you want things to go well and, and the performance to be to be a success. But um, I don't think the the viewer thinks so much about the degree of trepidation and um, uh, 
anxiety that the performer in magic has hoping that you know the the rabbit is somehow at the bottom of the hat and hasn't escaped or something like that you don't want to be made a fool of in, in front of an audience so I, and i think surgeons tend to feel that there is always an audience in inside and outside of the operating room and you need to perform well so i i thought it was good preparation i think also that, that this is a perfect moment to uh, to have a kind of homage to uh, to, to people who are uh, behind this scene, because I think about the uh, Peter's mother, who spent hours with him when he practiced, and that, you know who was the uh, the uh, public first public to uh, his trick, and every single time that she was seeing. Uh, uh, how tr the trick is working? No, no, no. You will do it again because <laughs> that was not good. And and you know the uh, the uh, love and the uh, devotion of the, this little woman uh, for his son practicing magic is unbelievable for me. It's it's really she she was a wonderful. Uh, agent and uh, and helper to to Peter's career, which yeah. also brings to mind um, the importance of the assistant. I remember the first time, the magical assistant that is the first time I saw it, a woman in half in the operating room. Of course, she didn't make it. I was not able to put her back together. <laughs> Just teasing. Just are, you, are you developing a comedy act as well, Dr. Chubak? We're, we're, we're so going on magic? the road. <laughs> we're going on the road. New Jersey's got talent. A little magic, a little humor. Yeah. I'm going to take this opportunity to pivot. <laughs> yes. there, there, I, I, Peter's had some really, really influential contributions to the field. And one of those was the SEPS procedure, the subcutaneous or subcutaneous endoscopic perforator ligation procedure. Can can you take us back to when you started that and what motivated you to do that? Obviously, from a surgical procedure that really had some significant morbidity in, um, with patients, and it was really a game changer for patients with incompetent perforators. Well, thank you for uh, bringing this up because I'm really so proud of of that procedure, and that's such an excellent procedure. But like all uh, or many procedures, they come, they uh, are used, and then they go because something uh, new and less invasive shows up. So uh, obviously, I had a deep interest in chronic venous disease. And, um, and uh, I was also a, uh, as you know well, I had to repeat my general surgery uh, residency uh, because of the board requirements. So uh, I got involved a little bit during that time already in uh, laparoscopic surgery. But the Mayo Clinic has the kind of collegiality and teamwork that many institutions don't have it at that level. And that's what helped me. So. Um, uh, the uh, I did not invent the SEPS procedure. Actually, the very first description of the SEPS procedure to place an endoscope uh, uh, came from Germany. But in the United States, it was Tom O'Donnell who wrote an article that he put uh, he put a, a, a scope subfascially, not subdermally, subfascially. That was the correct name of the procedure. Um, and uh, and and wanted to see the perforating vein as they go uh, through the fascia uh, uh, to the deep veins, but he could not really see well, so he was afraid to insufflate gas at that time, so he just perfused the subfascial space with water. And then, so I was sitting in there, I was reading actually literally the uh, the chapter in uh, uh, the Bergen and Kistner's uh, Atlas. And uh, I was talking to Mike Fornell, I said, Mike, can we insufflate gas into the surface? He said, sure, that's not a big deal. You know, at, at that time, they already insufflated gas all over the abdomen. So they just came together and uh, Mike Fornell, you know, I, I, I knew where to put the scope. 
Mike was in charge of the gas and uh, the rest of the uh, laparoscopic procedure. And we did together the first five to 10 procedures. And then I did, you know, two to 300 afterwards. So uh, uh, I think the, the idea that, uh, that came and you noticed somewhere and that deficiency of a procedure really stimulated me to see, obviously this is not, you know, that's not the solution that you perfuse it with water because even the water makes it, uh, you know, it, it's more difficult to see the blood vessels when, when there is water, but we could actually enlarge the space uh, with gas inf insufflation under pressure, just like it's done uh, every day in the operating room for uh, abdominal laparoscopic procedure. And that's how we developed uh, uh, that procedure. So for that, I take uh, all the credit that we developed that. Interesting enough, I figured out then that sometimes in the same year in uh, Australia and other Hungarian use started to use, Peter Conrad started to use gas insufflation. So we could never figure out whether I was the first or he was the first, but we were somewhere there. It, you know, this is a debate like, like did Parodi invent the endograft or was it Volodos who in invented the endograft? Well, I can end that debate. You were first, Peter. And <laughs> the... <laughs> <laughs> and but I do want to say, although you mentioned, I find this fascinating. Although you mentioned the fact that these procedures do come and go, and I think seps is probably one of those things that has gone by the wayside, uh, probably almost entirely now. But I would like you to comment on something which I had not really thought about before, which is. In my career as a cardiovascular surgeon, from the time I switched from general surgery and then moved on to my cardiovascular fellowship, in that period of time, we went from, in a seven-year period of time, from a full-length medial leg incision for harvesting the saphenous vein when I was a general surgeon rotating on cardiovascular with a heavy interest in cardiovascular. So I was always getting on that service as frequently as I could. From the groin to the ankle, full length incision, which had major morbidity, major, to skipping a small portion at the medial knee, to skip incisions. And finally, in my cardiac residency, we began doing the endoscopic vein harvesting using a scope and insufflation and so on and so forth. And I have to think that that was some sort of a modification or adaptation of the gas insufflation seps procedure that Peter was doing. And I'd like him to comment on that, but I would say that that of course is now the standard of care, remains the standard of care, has been for more than 20 years. So sometimes the technology comes, which in itself, uh, regresses and disappears, but may have application elsewhere where it has a major impact. And I don't have to tell the vascular surgeons in the group that that endovascular harvesting technique has saved countless numbers of people from tremendous, tremendous lower extremity morbidity after open heart surgery. So Peter, if you have any comments on that. Oh, well, I mean, the, I'm, I'm sure Mark could also comment because I believe that when you were uh, in the fellowship program, we were already doing uh, endoscopic harvesting, even for vascular cases. Actually, we did it for vascular cases, and then the cardiac surgeons took it over, and the the uh, uh, they trained specifically, you know, uh, 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 people to to do the procedure for the uh, the surgeons. So um, I don't know exactly whether uh, the SEPS procedure stimulated the, uh, the endoscopic harvesting, but they were awfully close to each other. I can, I can easily uh, uh, accept what you are saying, John, that uh, it is very likely that the SEPS procedure actually contributed uh, and uh, further 
helped to develop the subfacial, uh, the uh, endoscopic harvesting of the saphenous vein. I mean, I, I, I would be surprised if it, if it wasn't, or if it weren't absolutely um, true that seps was being done prior to end of endovascular endo uh, venous or harvesting. I yeah. think seps was was beforehand for sure. And the um, other the other interesting thing was in that same time period was when Peter and Dr. Cherry and Dr. Bauer were getting ready to do their first and cure. And yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear your reflections on the introduction of endovascular aortic aneurysm repair and some of your initial thoughts um, as you were preparing to do some of those first cases and what you thought that was going to, and now where that field is today. Well, uh, obviously, we were fascinated by uh, Parodi's work. I uh, knew Parodi right from the very beginning, from the 1990s, actually. Uh, he presented uh, the original work in 1990 or 1991, I believe, at the Society for Clinical Vascular Surgery. And we were sitting together uh, at a table with John Bergen, who actually helped him to publish the paper in the Annals of Vascular Surgery. And uh, Parodi and Parodi presented the uh, first uh, a few cases that was in uh, 1991. Uh, so. Uh, I, 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 I saw it, I was very excited about it, uh, but uh, in general, you know, a Mayo Clinic has been a very conservative, safe place for patients. The Mayo Clinic was never famous to try, to be the very first to try a new procedure. We always waited, we wanted to be sure with the concept that if I do an operation, I, you know, I operate you like a member of my family, you know, we could not offer immediately as early as Frank Wheat or other institutions were courageous enough to offer, as it turns out, a very, uh, I wouldn't call it unsafe, but a very, a, a procedure that was really not well tested yet. So, we, uh, at that time, with Ken Cherry and uh, the radiologist who we worked with, we decided to wait a little bit and see really, is this a procedure that is safe, that has uh, uh, good results to do? So that's why we, re we really placed the first anchor graft, if I believe in uh, 1995, 1994, 95, something like around, you know, the mid nineties. Uh, we did it together with uh, uh, two radiologists, Mike Johnson and uh, uh, Mike McCusick and uh, the team, that was the team, Ken Cherry, myself, uh, uh, and then the two radiologists. And uh, we, were very, we were very pleased at that time. Uh, this, we, this, this is another, I don't mean to step on your words there, Peter, but another interesting, <laughs> Uh, situation. I can remember around that same time as a general surgical resident in 95, 96, um, Bruce Brenner uh, at Beth Israel in Newark, who was my mentor in vascular there. I believe Bruce may have been the um, president of the Society for Clinical Vascular Surgery at one time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Before. But what, what I could remember about those cases was the enormous amount of preoperative evaluation of the scans and so forth. We were in there for hours. Everybody was terrified that this thing was the wrong length, the wrong size, the wrong diameter. There's not enough neck. Um, do, would, would you agree about with that, Peter? There was a lot of preoperative evaluation. Absolutely. I mean, imagine there's a new procedure with a a device that we really didn't know is going to hold up using a technique that we have never used before. You yeah. know, so days in advance, we would be planning these cases. And uh, and uh, uh, I think it it is uh, we obviously in in a way learned it by doing it. And the other thing that I would comment there, I, I I'm very um, 
sensitive and appreciative to your comments about the Mayo and the conservative nature. I found the same thing in Rochester. I felt that we were way behind in minimally invasive cardiac procedures and so forth for the same reasons, because we had had such a great track record with open surgery, open thoracoabdominal aneurysms and valve repairs and so on and so forth, that people were reticent to switch to something new before it was really tr proven to be as good or better. And one of the places I think we all remember that that started was with laparoscopic cholecystectomy. I think a lot of the private practice hospitals and, and, and um, community hospitals were much more aggressive getting going with that, especially with the fear of common duct injuries. And the university hospitals, especially here in New Jersey, I know it was true because I was here, lagged behind a little bit. Um, but I think that there's something good to be said about that because you're putting patient safety first, really. Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000 from Vita Support MD are backed by science and sold in doctor's offices. If you're a physician who may be interested in prescribing or selling these excellent nutraceuticals, please call 862-246-7877 to speak to a representative today. I want to bring Emily Eicher into the conversation because she's one of the nation's most respected there, you know, uh, physicians for treating lymphedema. And Emily, um, you know, we, we all just so appreciate your work and you've done, you've, you've established such a legacy. It, it's always a wonderful opportunity to spend time with you as well. But, you know, this is obviously for all of us, a great opportunity to spend time with both Monica and Peter at the same time. And I'm interested in your thoughts. Well, you are bringing back my memories on surgical residency. I did two years of surgery in Cabrini Medical Center, and we uh, did uh, rotate through St. Vincent's Hospital, where I did uh, two months or three months of cardiovascular. Uh, and the technique was to strip the saphenous vein, and the key was do it as fast as you can. And today I'm thinking back, how much damage did we do to the lymphatic system at that time? And yes, we stripped that the, the, the patient was fine with the heart, but ended up with swollen legs, had infection in the legs and so on. And we never paid attention to lymphatic system at that time. And that wasn't that long ago. It was in the early mid eighties. So now I think look, is it true? Was it in eighties? Yes, it was. Now, as you know, they closed the St. Vincent Hospital and St. Vincent Hospital is a very nice hospital. And I see now, uh, John, you were in Beth Israel, which was not that far from Cabrini Medical Center. And in, in I loved surgery. And in in my uh, little apartment on uh, my refri refrigerator, I had a suture set. And each time I went by, I was doing the repetition of dexterity and closing and so But now look at this, how we progressed. Everything is laparoscopic surgery. And remember way back when, when the first staples, they come. And Dr. Glowitzki, I met with you in Rome and I was just thinking, when was it? It was late 1990s with BB, BB Lee. There was a conference and we talked for a few minutes and I'm not quite sure if Monica was there, but it was great honor. Wow. Well, yeah, I remember that, that meeting, uh, you know, very much because that was uh, when 9-11 uh, uh, happened, if I remember, at least. Uh, I don't know if you, uh, you would remember if, not, if you saw 9-11 in uh, Rome or not, but we happened to be and actually with Monica. Yeah, uh, yeah, I was there. No. And John Bergen, we were uh, in uh, Rome when the two towers came down. I, and it was I unbelievable. Yeah. Monica, it's it's amazing the names we're throwing around from St. Vincent's. I don't know when you were cardiac in cardiac rotation there, if you remember Dr. Asinapura, Tony Asinapura was the chief of cardiac surgery there. And ironically, there was a graduate from Cabrini who was the chief resident in cardiac surgery at Beth Israel when I was there training with, with Victor Parsonet. Victor Parsonet was the uh, chief of cardiac surgery there. And the, we had a Cabrini, I was a general surgery resident at the time, but we had a Cabrini graduate. So it's a lot of, a lot of uh, overlap between this small world of ours. It is small world. 
Well, well nobody yeah. speaking, you know, all the world of the uh, uh, vascular specialist is relatively small comparing with the uh, uh, with the other specialty as far as I can I can see. But I, I would like yeah I would like to bring Peter a little bit more uh, on the phlebo lymphedema concept and uh, uh, how does it change maybe the treatment of patients with uh, chronic uh, venous disease that might require uh, following the uh, the the new concept of uh, phlebo lymphedema that those patients might require the, uh, the lymphedema typical treatment. And if you can also at the same time debunk the idea of the glycocalyx. <laughs> <laughs> Just for in that, in you know. that discussion. <laughs> <laughs> for because we're not so sure about that. Uh, you know, we all learned a glycocalyx somewhere in the last decade or so, and uh, the uh, the new concept that all fluid that is in the subcutaneous space is reabsorbed by the lymphatics. And uh, I, I always just call attention to the fact that we believe that in patients with lymphedema that glycocalyx may be damaged. So there is really a reabsorption probably uh, both ways in the veins and the lymphatics. I myself, you know, uh, did a lot of uh, lymphangiogram in uh, in uh, uh, experimental animals. And I noticed that when I used uh, uh, methylene blue, which is a little bit lower molecular weight than the uh, indocyanin green or the patent blue, that is completely absorbed by the lymphatic system. Patent blue has a lower molecular weight and when you inject it, it subcutaneously, the animals became blue almost immediately. Uh, and this is also with patients. If you give the patient subcutaneously methylene blue, they become blue immediately. And that's why, you know, my thinking is that this cannot be just completely reabsorbed by the lymphatics, it has to be reabsorbed at least in part by the venous system. Otherwise, it would not turn. The patient cannot, you know, turn blue uh, immediately after or very very soon after the injection. So I still have. I, I'm not debunking the idea of, of glycocalyx, and I respect everybody who, uh, you know, su uh, support the concept that. All the subcutaneous fluid has to be reabsorbed by the lymphatics, but I have uh, my doubts and my exceptions uh, that it uh, uh, certainly in pathologic situation that is not always the case. Saying that the concept of phlebo lymphedema, uh, you know, has been around at least uh, I would say uh, 20 25 years in my mind. We were talking with. John Bergen about this at least two decades ago. And um, uh, I think it makes a, a, a lot of sense that uh, in patients who have severe venous disease, you know, the, there is an increased uh, uh, amount of subcutaneous fluid that produces a high output lymphatic failure uh, that obviously results in lymphedema. So first you have got a high output lymphatic failure in venous obstruction or incompetence. And then in the chronic stage of chronic venous insufficiency, you have the inflammatory changes that actually physically damages the lymphatic system. Uh, uh, in addition, if the patient had a stripping, as, as we heard before, obviously you can have more lymphatic uh, damage, but, uh, you know, in the late stage of phlebolymphedema, this originally high output lymphatic uh, failure actually will become very likely an obstructive low output failure because of the uh, uh, associated lymphatic damage caused by the inflammatory 
process due to chronic venous disease. If I can ask your viewpoints about, so specifically in C5, C6 patients, management of axial reflux. So do you think that tumescence and heat ablation or a heat source potentially compromises the, to, to Emily's point, the, the ventral medial bundle even more? And do you think non-tumescent, non-thermal options may ultimately be proven to have a better benefit in terms of recovery by potentially not damaging the, lymphat the compromised lymphatics even further? And I don't know if there's even data out there that would support any of that at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Well, number one, Emily brought up the issue that with a conventional Meyer stripper, we damage the lymphatic system because the medial lymphatic bundle is the most important lymphatic drainage of the leg. About 80% of the leg lymphatics are really taken by the medial lymphatic bundle. That includes, uh, you know, usually amazingly single long lymphatics, uh, you know, that are in number about, you know, I would say, you know, six to 12 uh, uh, lymphatics. And I've seen those lymphatics because we have dissected these lymphatics for lymphatic bypass. I mentioned the name of uh, Rudiger Baumeister, who is a fantastic plastic surgeon from Munich, who actually did Palma procedure, and you know what a Palma procedure is for venous occlusion, a suprapubic venous bypass. Well, we did at Mayo Clinic, with Baumeister, we did suprapubic lymphatic bypasses, dissecting lymphatics from the saphenous vein. The lymphatics are sitting right on the saphenous vein. It's amazing that actually a couple or two to three lymphatics, when you put dye into the leg and you incise uh, and expose the saphenous vein, you find two to three single long lymphatics attached very closely to the saphenous vein. And actually we dissected those and took it over suprapubically as a lymphatic graft and anastomosed it to lymphatics on the uh, diseased side. And this is, a, this is a procedure that works mostly in Baumeister hand because he has developed an amazing expertise and published on this, including uh, uh, you can see pictures in Rutherford's vascular surgery of, of uh, some of the cases that he did. But what I am saying is, is that yes, anything that damages the lymphatics that are so intimately on the saphenous vein contribute to uh, uh, lymphatic damage and subsequent, you know, uh, uh, potentially uh, lymphedema. And do you see any therapies on the near horizon that can help in terms of lymphatic regenerative capacity? Uh, well, uh, obviously, uh, as we see, uh, lymph vessel regeneration uh, and uh, lymph vessel generation uh, in, in some studies mostly obviously experimental, but there are, uh, you know, these, these uh, uh, there are new clinical studies where they observe some new uh, lymphatic regeneration in uh, patients who have some kind of uh, lymphatic malformations. So I, I, I think there is, uh, uh, there is uh, increasing research into drugs, and I don't know exactly which which type of drug is the best in this area, but I would say that uh, that uh, uh, there is a chance that you know there will be some uh, result in drug-induced lymphatic regeneration. But clearly, the most important thing for young surgeons is is don't do no harm. Don't if we can teach avoiding injury of the, the, the lymphatics in the first place, that's going to be the, past, the patient's best outcome. Well, absolutely. And, and you know, Mark, when we, when we teach the younger vascular surgeon how to just simple things, how to expose the femoral artery or how to uh, uh, remove the saphenous vein, they really try to 
be uh, 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 you know uh, the most conservative as far as lymphatic uh, damage is concerned because there's a huge amount of uh, uh, lymphatic uh, tissue lymph nodes lymph vessels that are medial to the femoral artery and the femoral vein uh, if you uh, damage those number one you will see the problems of lymphocytes and you will see the problem of infections and uh, uh, that alone you know should uh, be you know is very important in vascular surgery but in general as you said i think in patients where we treat uh, patients with chronic venous disease and the oblate veins, we have to know that the lymphatic system is so close to the venous system and uh, that the medial lymphatic bundle in the legs uh, is extremely important. I'll ask a quick question of you, uh, Dr. Maline. Of course, I'm the only non-physician on the panel, so when things are said that I don't understand, that means maybe other non-physicians don't understand. You asked Dr. Glavitsky about a C5 patient or a C6. Can you just briefly tell us what that means? Oh, Paul, I'm so glad you're asking me to clarify that. <laughs> so um, so C1 would be patients, and, and there's been a whole revision on this, what's called a CEAP, so Clinical Etiology Anatomic Pathophysiology Rating. Doctors Glavitsky were both into, uh, really important in terms of this new classification that came out in the last couple of years. But in uh, purest form, C1 is spider veins, which we almost all have. That's an effect of gravity, as is all venous lymphatic disease. C2 would be type ordinary varicose veins. C3 is where you start to see swelling. Four is where you start to see significant skin changes. Six, and I'm skipping five purposely, six is where you have an open ulcer related to uh, veins not functioning correctly. And then uh, C5 is somebody who had an open ulceration but has gone on to heal. So that's, the, and I'm so glad, Paul, that you asked us to, to clarify that. So, okay, just out of curiosity, do you see patients before they get to C5 or C6, or is that when they make their way to you at some point? Well, as, as a surgeon now working in a wound clinic, um, the goal is always to, to close the wound clinic. And that's part of where being able to work with. Doctors uh, Glavitsky, Schubach, ideally the education, educational component is identify so far upstream that patients never develop a venous ulcer, which is such a significant impact on quality of life. Monica's written a wonderful paper out of a uh, Mayo Clinic uh, on the, the epidemiology project and the efforts to try to decrease overall occurrence. There's many people working on those efforts. So it is, and all the great work that John does in his clinic, John Schubach, uh, ideally, we're treating so far upstream, both from a um, lifestyle standpoint, compression stocking standpoint, intervention standpoint, the patients never develop a, a venous ulceration. Okay, uh, so obviously the goal for patients then, if they have this, is to get to you as soon as possible and not yeah. wait till it gets to five or six. Okay, I appreciate it. Yeah. Carry well, on. That's, I just to ask that's such, such an important point. I'm so glad you uh, you asked us to clarify that. All right. I didn't mean to interrupt, but carry on. Whoever oh, thanks, is next. Paul. That's that's very helpful for our listeners. Sometimes we get carried away with ourselves. <laughs> All right. Who is next? Uh, Dr. Iker is back. Uh, Dr. Iker. Well, my internet was interrupted for a while in the beginning, but this is very important meeting for everybody. And I just wanted to point out that sometimes when I see lymphedema on the ultrasound and these patients come with swollen lower extremities for different type of a diagnostic problem, uh, when I see a lot of fluid component trapped, these patients tend to improve greatly when we use the manual lymph drainage and also combination of manual lymph drainage, which is the uh, light uh, massage type stimulation and combination of the compression pump treatment. And of course, for these patients, they have to adhere to a compliance. Once we reduce some of the swelling, they have to wear compression stockings because the treatment is treatment success or efficacy is not uh, long lasting if they are not compliant. And th that's a very important comment and certainly uh... The, the medical side of the treatment plays a, a huge role. And uh, um, 
uh, actually, um, I was thinking that, uh, uh, you know, the uh, intervention uh, per se uh, have the uh, validity only if they are preceded and followed by the, uh, the, very, uh, the uh, very strict medical uh, treatment. And we have the discussion previously with lymphedema patients that this is something that uh, uh, many of patients are uh, having wrong, having the expectation that if they go for the, uh, the, uh, the surgery, it will be miracle uh, uh, and they will be all cured. And that's not true. All these patients with, uh, will require the uh, medical treatment uh, and the congestive treatment precisely. And I think I'll jump in there because this is such an interesting conversation. Um, and the show has been so successful, I, I believe, uh, for me, from my perspective, how much I've learned in having our conversations and having some of our wonderful guests, uh, present company, of course, uh, at the top of the list. But Emily and I, prior to coming on camera, I was discussing uh, briefly with the rest of the group. Emily and I have been conferring about a patient of mine who is only 17 years old, who has in the right lower extremity, phlebolympholipedema, stage one, and in the left lower extremity, um, lipedema. And so that is another thing that perhaps Dr. Peter Glavitsky could give his um, uh, sage advice on for patients and practitioners we're finding more and more and more that these um, diagnoses and pathological conditions are not always standing alone as pure lipedema, lymphedema, or um, chronic venous insufficiency. And I think that the contemporary practitioner and the real expert in this field has to be able to um, diagnose each and see when there's an overlap. And with, to Monica's point, with this young woman whose mother, whose mother is my patient, um, although she does have venous disease, which would be uh, amenable to intervention, I'm not intervening now at her young age because she's relatively asymptomatic. And I got her in the hands of Omnitherapy, a previous guest of ours, physical therapist with 30 years experience for manual lymphatic drainage, compression education, nutrition education, anti-inflammatory. She is on the lymphatic um, lymphatic formula 1000. And interestingly, after a couple of weeks in knee-high compression, um, she has seen reduction in the right leg where she does have a uh, venous component and very little reduction in the left leg, which is purely, purely lipedema. So Peter, if you'd like to maybe um, comment on those thoughts. I would love to hear your input. Uh, uh, you brought, a, uh, brought up a beautiful example of a patient having three different problems. And uh, as, as, as you know, and anybody who sees these type of patients, this is not rare that patient has a mixed cause of mixed etiology of limb swelling. I think for us uh, physician, um, physicians, number one, uh, the, the real goal should be to try to figure out exactly what is behind this. And then that when we, we proceed with any type of treatment, we don't hurt the patient with the treatment. Because, uh, uh, you know, doing ablation in a patient with lymphedema when there is a borderline or no real incompetence uh, is not something we should do. Uh, I think we should clarify whether this is a lymphedema, this is a lipedema, and uh, chronic venous insufficiency. And it is not easy. It is not easy because, uh, uh, fortunately, we have duplex scan, and duplex scan uh, helps us to clarify the venous etiology in uh, most of the cases. The diagnosis of lymphedema is, you know, primarily history. Uh, physical exam and, uh, you know, lymphocytogram is number one, not available in, uh, in most uh, places and uh, people really don't know how to use it. So 
when you look at the current guidelines that uh, came out from the American Venus Forum, the panel didn't really think that lymphocytogram really should be done in patients to exclude uh, lymphedema. You know, I, I have a different, uh, uh, you know, standpoint or different opinion because at Mayo Clinic we did hundreds and hundreds of lymphocytograms, so we know it will diagnose lymphedema. The question is, of course, what to do with it. You know, yeah. And how much more information you? And then, you know, uh, lipedema. The difference between lipedema and lymphedema. I think. We are just getting now into the better lymphatic imaging uh, uh, modalities, uh, MR, lymphocytogram, lymphatic duplex, you know. So um, I think we, have, we are going to see an acceleration of our diagnostic capabilities to really separate lymphedema from lipedema. But well, one of, one of the things I was working on today quite frankly, for the first time in all these years because of Dr. Eicher's uh, tutelage and uh, input here on the program and our discussion. Emily, I was, I was looking um, at the soft tissues with the ultrasound myself today to look at some of the examples you showed me that you sent me and looking at the different, um, of course, I've always been looking at fluid collection and the so-called ant farm appearance and the hypoechoic a collection of fluid in patients with edema of the lower extremity. But I was looking specifically at the fascial patterns that you talk about. Maybe you can comment on uh, your um, use of soft tissue ultrasound to look at fascial patterns and how you evaluate those. Uh, thank you so very much for this question. And perhaps if you wish next time, we can talk about lipidema, which the diagnosis is so... Um, commonly misused for obesity and so on. But I am concerned about lipidema in children. And usually when the mothers are coming with the little kids and the mama has the lipidema component, then I do the ultrasound on all uh, and on everybody and the little ones too. And uh, unanimously, I am finding out disruption of the subcutaneous fascia in lipidema patients. And way back when I called it dancing fascia and it was cute because when I went to the European group of lymphology this uh, wonderful Italian physician showed the dancing fascia and she said as per Dr. Eike this is ballerina fascia so it's not really a ballerina fascia it's a dancing fascia and there is we need to investigate not only the subcutaneous space of the enlargement of the subcutaneous space in lipidema patients, but what is really happening to the fascia. And I think the fascia is overly stretched, sometimes disrupted. And frequently when I do the ultrasound, I almost see bifurcation of the fascia and impregnation of the subcutaneous fat in, in between the fascia layer. So this is typical for lipidema patients when you see the uh, hypoechogenic subcutaneous space with enlarged uh, subcutaneous space. And the skin is much thinner than you see in control or unlike in lymphedema. In lymphedema, the, the dermis is much greater for various reasons. So uh, th this is so typical about lipidema. And what I want to point out, what do we know? Not that much, but even though we can diagnose better, and instead of using um, uh, lymphocytography when uh, the patient's financial ability is unable to comply with this, I, I do the ultrasound, which is uh, less e uh, expensive. And I can get some uh, results from that. On the particular patient that we saw, proximally you see lipedema patients, or the one that I saw uh, send you. Proximally you see lipedema and distally where the patient on my patient had left lower extremity, clear varicosity, and she was maybe 15 years, 13 years old. And it's congenital. So you have already, uh, and on the ultrasound, you see clear-cut lipolymphedema segmental. 
So I think this was a, a genetic problem with uh, disturbance of the vena circulation distally for various reasons and lipidema. But one point about lipidema, what can we do? If we diagnose early, this is the key. And, and then we can guide with nutrition, exercise program and compression. And of course the manual lymph drainage and compression pumps are of great value. But recently I just did study on one patient who is, I'm following the patient since the age of eight. And the patient is now lipidema, clear cut lipidema, blossomed at the age of 12 when there was a surge of hormonal explosion where you can see these young girls having even stretch marks and suddenly the body just explodes, uh, changes and they gain weight. And uh, there is one that I presented that in one year she gained 80 pounds and it's total disproportion of the lower body from the upper body where you have the enlargement in symmetrical distribution of the lower extremities, thighs, buttock, and also abdominal area. But this particular patient that I want to tell you is started high school and became a member of a cross country running team. And in three months, she reduced without any manual lymph drainage or so, just with running, reduced the subcutaneous space to about 40%, which is tremendous. So I think the key is to uh, teach pediatricians to recognize the lipedema patients in a female population because it occurs in female population only and guide the parents with the activity and nutrition. So the patients don't blossom to stage two, stage three, and then some with uh, huge lobes in lower extremity of this very soft, squishy subcutaneous tissue of lipidema, unlike lymphedema. And then they will have much better quality of life. So I think we have a lot of work to do, although uh, for the past 10 years, there is tremendous progress um, with lipidema and lymphedema in the United States. But I think we need to diagnose these kids early and then guide them. Thank you. That's very helpful, Emily. Thank you. You know, it is incredibly interesting, Emily, because obviously the first lipidema report was in Mayo Clinic Proceedings, I think in 1941, 42. And you know, lipedema wasn't obviously discovered in Rochester, Minnesota, nor in Olmstead County. And I think it goes back to one of Dr. Glavitsky's early comments on collaboration and the ability to sit and think together like you're educating us on right now. And you can just imagine Heinz and Bar Drs. Heinz and Barker uh, in a lounge talking about these women that they're seeing with this unusual distribution. And Dr. Plummer had set up this phenomenal a masterful system of categorizing a record system that, that didn't exist anyplace else in the world. It was kind of the epic of the day, it, it, to, to paraphrase it. And I think they just were able to go back and say, look, pull the last 300 people that had these kind of symptoms. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, but out of that, they could create many papers of that kind of nature came out of Rochester early on because of collegiality, collaboration, and intellectual curiosity. And then with Dr. Plummer's um, masterful way of putting together a record system, you could, you could access records. And how do we maintain that going forward? Because now you're talking about a pediatric population that's being described. And that information is so critical to get out to the, the masses to help these young women so they, they can have a quality of life uh, rather than going down a really difficult road. Absolutely. But Again, these young kids, they have to be diagnosed and, and then guided. The uh, uh, record system at Mayo is amazing. And uh, you have record number of rooms from uh, 1907. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and all the records are available. Uh, and I think the way to uh, continue uh, it currently, it's only possible with electronic medical records. And uh, let's just hope that, uh, you know, these records 
are and will be available. And I think, uh, uh, you know, Mayo Clinic certainly has been a leader in this. Paul, I think it may be time to wrap it up, although our time went quickly. We're going to have to convince Dr. Glavitsky to come back again. Uh, we have so much more to talk about and so many avenues to explore. And if I can, if I can just say, Peter, it is we are so blessed to have Monica with us, you know, every other week. So I, uh, thank you for her time and her talent. And you know, the other talent that we didn't even get into with Peter is his. He's got such a great eye for photography. So we'll have to bring that up next time we're all together. And of course, Monica's painting, uh, international painting status is tremendous. So, so many things to talk about it next time. All right. Very good. Excellent show. And again, as the only non-physician, I can tell you, I've learned more about this in 14 episodes and I learned the rest of my life put together. So <laughs> I thank you as well. And I know the medical people out there are learning tons. And we thank everybody for listening and watching to uh, LymphCast episode 14. Now, let's thank our panel before we uh, bid you farewell. Uh, from uh, California, Dr. Emily Eicher. Uh, Dr. Eicher, thank you for everything today. We'll see you next time. Thank you. It was a great honor, doctors, our Excellent. old team. All right, very good. Uh, from Arizona, Dr. Monica Glavisky. Thank you, ma'am, and uh, we'll see you next time as well. Absolutely, and thank you for having us both today. All right, you bet. Uh, from Minnesota, Dr. Mark Moline. Uh, first of all, thank you for everything. And then if you would have the honor of uh, thanking Dr. Peter Glavitsky, and then I'll get to Dr. Chuback after that. We'd appreciate it. But thank you, Dr. Moline, for everything. Well, privilege. And, you know, Peter, I know your time is so valuable. And I want to thank you for spending a solid hour with us and really uh, pulling back the veil of time and showing us how you got to where you did. And uh, you know, congratulations just on a phenomenal career that is not over, and we look forward to all the future contributions. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you, uh, thank all of you for uh, inviting me. It has been really a privilege to uh, uh, participate in this webinar, and I am more than happy to come back to talk about uh, things that we all love so much, uh, veins and lymphatics. All right. Thank you very much. And the uh, uh, founder and owner of Vita Support MD, maker of Vein Formula 1000, Lymphatic Formula 1000, also the creator of this show, LymphCast, physician and surgeon from New Jersey, Dr. John A. Chuback. Uh, Dr. Chuback, as always, thank you for everything. And we'll see you next time as well. Thank you, Paul. Today has been a real treat. And I want to point out, uh, Mark uh, touched on Dr. Monica Glavitsky's uh, outstanding fine art career as an oil painter and artist. And I don't think we've mentioned it before on the show, but I'm going to make sure that we continue to do so. Everyone who's listening should check out monicalglavitsky.com, which is her art um, site, scientist, physician, artist, and look at her beautiful works there. And also, I think we should highlight Dr. Eicher, who we continue to point out, is a world-class expert in lymphedema and lipedema in Santa Monica, California, at the uh, Lymphedema Center. And anyone in and around that area who's looking for expertise and advice in that area should certainly look up Dr. Eicher. And anyone in the uh, Minneapolis area, Dr. Mark Moline, who is a Mayo-trained world-class general and vascular surgeon specializing in very, very difficult, complex, challenging, non-healing wounds. Anyone who may have a family member, a loved one, or themselves who's dealing with those channels, uh, those challenges, please up, look up Dr. Mark Moline, M-E-L-I-N, in, in that area. And then finally, Dr. Peter Glavitsky, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's a great honor. It's a great privilege to uh, call you a colleague and certainly a friend. And we all um, look up to you and you've been a great inspiration to all of us. And as I said, the door is always open and the porch light will always be on if you should des <laughs> decide to return to us and spend more time to talk about any number of subjects. It has been a real pleasure and uh, a real honor. Thank you, sir. All right, and thank you again to all of our uh, listeners and our viewers. This has been LymphCast, episode 14, and we'll see you next time for LymphCast, episode 15. Have a great day. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time.